Much of her life consists of making small talk with strangers, than which there is nothing more tiring, and in expressing interest, real or feigned, in all the interesting and boring things her subjects do. In 1953, she committed her life to the service of her people, Elizabeth. The first 30 years in Our World, 7.30 Tuesday. Well, I'll be very personally disappointed if he applies for the reward, uh, Patrick. Uh, I think it ought to be considered part of his duty. Constable Ian Goldsmith doesn't agree. He nabbed the most wanted man in Australia, and he wants his reward. Good evening. Well, I think by now anyone who's been following the story of the capture of Australia's most wanted man, the rogue cop Colin Creed, has got a pretty strong opinion on whether the man who caught him, an Adelaide policeman who was on holiday in Perth, should get the $50,000 reward. And quite honestly, I think they should give him the money. But there are others around here who won't have a bar of that. Anyway, we'll be asking the man himself shortly, and he's showing us exactly how he caught Colin Creed. Uh, but later also, we have a profile of Bill Hayden, a very frank Bill Hayden. And it's a reminder, I think, of just how quickly fortunes can fluctuate in politics. Seven months ago, there he was, down on the floor, deposed as Labor leader after five fairly impressive years. Now, Australia's foreign minister, and doing the job with a great deal of distinction and flair. But first, a price on his head. Here's Dale Sinclair in Adelaide. Well, the South Australian government had offered a reward of $50,000 for the capture of Creed, but whether the holidaying South Australian policeman collects it remains to be seen. A controversy has developed over the propriety of a serving policeman collecting a reward for doing what is essentially his duty. It has even shifted into the political arena, but the arguments against the payment are best summed up by Ray Whitrod, the former Queensland Police Commissioner who spoke on Nationwide last night. Well, I, I don't think it's too far-fetched to suggest that uh, some policemen uh, could, in fact, uh, delay making arrests until the, ar until the prize money is increased. Uh, I notice in South Australia there is a practice of increasing the amounts over time, which in itself is a bad thing. Uh, there's no reason why police could not be seen to be in the role of bounty hunters. Colin James Creed returned to South Australia this afternoon under heavy police guard. After two and a half years of freedom, his immediate future is one of close confinement. The likely charges, murder, rape and robbery. For Creed's former colleagues in the South Australian Police Force, his capture is a relief. He was the rogue cop who gave the whole force a bad name and he was an embarrassment for slipping through the police net. In the meantime, Constable Ian Goldsmith, the man who cited the elusive Creed, is basking in the limelight. In this report, he reenacts the scenes leading up to the arrest of Creed for Kim Jordan. Ian Goldsmith's one in a million sighting was made in Perth's Hay Street West. He saw the man wanted by every cop in Australia as he took his wife and children to an inner city car park. With Creed in his sights, he began following the fugitive. His wife telephoned local detectives and senior constable Goldsmith shadowed Creed known as a master of disguise. They travelled down Hay Street to Perth's Hay Street Mall. How did you feel when, when you were behind Creed, right here? Did you think he was, he was going to run away? Well, I, I, was, I was aware that he was going into a, into a shout, crowded uh, shopping complex in, into the mall. Do you think he was aware that you were following him? No. Uh, I, I purposely remained behind him. So what were you looking for at that time? A police officer? Somebody to help you? Yeah, I, was, I was hoping to find a, uh, a beat patrolman. Goldsmith continued to stalk Creed, never getting too close to his quarry, but ready to chase if Creed spotted him. In the mall, Creed turned into the Carillion Centre arcade. All right, so what happened here when you reached the Carillion Centre? Yeah, he, uh, he turned left and uh, stopped here a uh, short time. Uh, browsing through the shops and then, then walked on briskly. Did you think he, he may have seen you at this stage? Oh, there's a lot of reflections in the, uh, in the shop, uh, shop windows there in the glass and uh, I don't know. So after that you just kept on following him? That's right. So down here. With Goldsmith a few paces behind him, Creed walked into Perth's ABC shop. Goldsmith followed. Excuse me, I'm uh, 
South Australian police officer, I believe Colin Creed's in the shop. Um, could you ring the police, please? Is he wanted, is he? Right, I'll go and get you straight away. Do you know the number? Triple O, is it? Triple O? While Creed browsed among books and records, Goldsmith contacted local detectives. Excuse me, he's just about to make a purchase. Can you come quickly? Right. With Creed out of the shop, Goldsmith gave chase again. Creed was finally cornered by local detectives in Perth's Murray Street. They'd arrived on the scene after the ABC shop call and two-way radio contact with a beat patrolman. Right, so he's finally caught here. How did you feel catching Australia's most wanted criminal? Well, I was, uh, I was actually uh, elated that, that we'd caught, caught him um, and that uh, he wasn't going to do any more jobs. And uh, being a, a rogue uh, policeman, that uh, the integrity of the South Australian Police Department was at stake. Well, did you think at any time, as a member of that South Australian Police Department, that you would be actually the one who'd end up catching him when you're on holiday? No, no I one of those uh, once in a million experiences. With the chase over and his name in every newspaper in the country, Senior Constable Goldsmith has had time to reflect. The idea of a reward never occurred to him as he tracked Creed down. Uh, I, all I wanted to do was catch him, uh, or, or have, some, you know, have the police here catch him. Do you think you deserve the reward? I think, well, I... It would, be, it would be nice to uh, receive it, yes. What, what do you say then to, to the, uh, the contention that you're a police officer and despite the fact you're on holidays, you were just really doing your duty? Well, uh, I'm on holidays. As soon as, as, soon as I cross the border in, from uh, South Australia into Western Australia, I, I become John Citizen. And, and as such, um, just like you or, uh, or any other person, I've got no powers of arrest here. Well, that's Constable Goldsmith's position, and it's interesting because he's still choosing his words very carefully there. You see, if you were watching the program last night, you'll have heard the South Australian Police Union is backing him. The union is saying if he claims that reward, he should get it. Senior police in South Australia are saying they hope he won't claim it. Now, he's not saying yet whether he intends to claim it or not. He says it would be nice, he'd like to have it, who wouldn't? I mean, who'd say no to $50,000? But you see, the thing is, they can't just give it to him. He has to claim that reward if he wants it. It'll be interesting to see what he does eventually do. I imagine there'll be a good deal of pressure put on him once he crosses the border back into South Australia. Well, seven months ago, I don't think many people could have predicted the vigour with which Bill Hayden would have bounced back onto the political stage. As Foreign Minister, he's adopted an extraordinarily high profile and has spent a great deal of his first six months in the job establishing links with the ASEAN countries. It's not been a job without controversy, though. Aid to Vietnam, East Timor and so on. But Bill Hayden is making a mark. As many see it, he's making a mark against the odds. Jenny Brockie prepared this profile. You drink because you're going on TV now. Or you're off cigarette. <laughs> it was a jocular Bill Hayden who played host to South Pacific leaders in Canberra recently. But as I was telling Bob Hawke, I have absolutely no sympathy for him since he's given up drinking. Because there's no variety left in his life. Every morning he wakes up, a good morning. And he wouldn't know the difference. I know the difference between good mornings and bad mornings, and I enjoy the good ones. If appearances count for anything, Bill Hayden is riding high. The man dumped by his own party just seven months ago has leapt back into the fray with an air of confidence and determination unsettling for some of his colleagues. Tradition has it that deposed leaders tend to fade to political oblivion. Not so the member for Oxley, who seems curiously galvanised by his setback. When we were up in uh, Weiling in China recently, the chairman of the local uh, regional committee said to me, I was talking to him about Australian building workers up there doing a few construction jobs. And he said, oh, my word, they can drink. I saw one of them drink five cans of beer in an hour one day. I said, I drink that by myself without any trouble. It doesn't have to be hot. Bill Hayden has been in politics long enough to have learned the best form of self-preservation. 
I remember talking with Freddie Daly on one occasion, who's probably had more experience than any of us have had or are likely to have because he came up through a tough machine in Sydney in the party. And uh, Fred was saying to me that one of the things he regretted was a massive argument he had with Gough Whitlam. And it was so very personal and bitter, and I remember it. Of all things, it was over white Australia immigration policy. It took f 10 years for Fred to get rid of that bitterness. And he was saying to me, you know, one day I thought to myself, now why am I bitter to towards Whitlam? I can't really remember the root causes of this. And uh, I've seen a lot of people like that, and I've learned a lesson from it. Bill Hayden's political career began 22 years ago. As a Queensland policeman, he won the then Liberal seat of Oxley in the swing against the Menzies government in 1961. Hayden's father was a radical, an American seaman who jumped ship and settled in Australia. His mother, the person who first stressed the virtue of never being too trusting, even of close associates. As the eldest son of a working class family, young Bill could not afford the luxury of an uninterrupted education. I had to run hard to catch up because I left school early and I ran awfully hard. It was a, a long distance endurance race doing part time study to qualify at university and then later on to find, I think, probably 60 to 70 percent of economics that I studied I could have done without and studied something more productive, but that's a controversial <laughs> view. Uh, and I read widely to, to catch up. How's it going? Right there, bloke. Hey? Bill Hayden is still very much the local lad made good on his home ground. An early morning visit to a coal mine near Ipswich is a casual affair. Hayden knows the men and is well received. Hmm? You should have Clive Klaus over here with you. That's right. Where's Clive working now? Twelve. Bill Hayden has lived in this area most of his life a conservative working-class electorate about an hour's drive from Brisbane. It's a place where clanship and familiarity are a politician's best assets. Loyalty runs uh, deep in the Hayden camp. Since the AWU joined our faction, we ceased being centre-left, we're now centre-majority. Centre-majority? <laughs> <laughs> Power numbers are important. What's Bruce These days, no one's dwelling on what the Foreign Minister describes as the fallout. But there's the odd memento adorning his office, a reminder of the biggest personal defeat in Bill Hayden's political career. I want to say this, I am not convinced that the Labor Party would not win under my leadership. I believe that, that a drover's dog could lead the Labor Party to victory, the way the country is and the way the opinion polls are showing up for the Labor Party. It's a funny sort of feeling. Um, it left you with that sort of tingly feeling all over that I expect you would experience if your soul was boiled in oil for two or three days. But uh, <laughs> of course I got rid of those feelings very quickly, of course. It was an experience that, um, that had its pain, but you can't dwell on those things. You become obsessive, you become neurotic, you become a nuisance to everyone. They're impatient with you. Given the build-up to the leadership change, do you feel now like it's just a big weight that's been lifted off your shoulders? Ah, oh, I wouldn't quite say that. It's uh, the aspiration of being Prime Minister is a very worthy one and uh, it's the highest public office in this country. And I guess I always looked at it in that context. Can you see a situation where you might be Prime Minister at some stage in the future? Only if that proverbial bus careers out of control in the front of Parliament House. <laughs> But then I fear I might be uh, crippled under the stampede of those rushing in to the vacant space. I don't spend any time thinking about those things. Whatever his private feelings, Bill Hayden is standing firm. No breaking of ranks and no howls of self-indulgence. It's a position supported by his wife Dallas, who for more than 20 years has shared the ups and downs of her husband's political career. Dallas Hayden says the entire family was hurt by events earlier this year. She won't be drawn on the depth of that feeling, or reports that she urged her husband to get out of politics. As far as she's concerned, that's all over. She does, however, express frustration at the media's treatment of her husband. I think all politicians' wives get upset with some, the way their husbands are portrayed at times. You think it's unfair, I mean, when you know that's not what they're like, or 
I've seen interviews cut short when you know they're saying something else and, and going on a bit differently. Uh, or they write up things that aren't true. And, and that hurts? And of course it hurts. When you know it doesn't, it's not true. It's part of life, though. You've got to accept it. What about, the norm. what about your children? How have they coped with having such a high-profile father? I think they've coped fairly well. They're, they're good children and um, we haven't had any problems. And uh, they were very hurt when their father was deposed. Or when he stood down, I should say. He didn't he wasn't deposed, it was when he stood down. Um, he made the decision, but it was... Uh, they naturally... They think he's the best. They think he'll, he'd be a great Prime Minister, but it's not to be. He's, he's enjoying being Foreign Minister. That's it. It's as far as Dallas Hayden will go. It's the best we can do for you? It's rare for cameras to be allowed into the Hayden home. But today, we're offered breakfast, shared with a member of Hayden's personal staff 